Uh, so, shall we get started? I want to talk today about uh, the physics of bacteria, the physics of pathogens, and also methods that we can use um, to, uh, yeah, to approach uh, this type of science, right? Uh, so, the first part of my talk is going to be a tutorial about holographic microscopy and imaging bacteria in three dimensions. And then in the second part of the talk, I'd like to discuss how we can use these tools to study the spreading, the motility, uh, and the mechanisms behind uh, bacterial uh, contamination dynamics. So uh, shall we get started? Uh, let me see, I have to press a button over here. Good. So maybe first I'd like to give you an introduction into why we are interested in this, right? And uh, bacterial uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance is uh, is something that's growing very rapidly at the moment. Uh, here are some figures from the uh, United Nations, and they predict that by the year 2050, more people will die from bacteria than from cancer. So if you look at those numbers at the bottom, at the moment, that number is around 700,000 for AMR, and that number is expected to grow to about 10 million if we don't do anything now. Uh, and of course, this comes with a large cost in terms of healthcare and an also very unfair distribution of people around the world uh, yeah, that would suffer from, from these types um, of, uh, of diseases. So on the right hand side uh, is a list of different types of bacterial infections that are involved here that really range, you know, uh, from organs all across the body, neuro infections, skin infections, uh, already you know, before the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, pulmonary infections were already one of the leading causes um, of death worldwide. Uh, and so uh, this is only growing at the moment. So, so we really need to come up with new ideas and new strategies to counter uh, yeah, bacteria. And, and if we can do that using physics and using tools from engineering and science together, then we have a chance of beating this. Now, the uh, first person uh, who was, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, famous for looking at bacterial motility uh, is, of course, Howard Berg. And uh, I guess that many people in the audience have already seen this video of E. coli bacteria uh, with fl fluorescently labeled flagella. Uh, and what you can see is that these flagella will tend to bundle and unbundle, and that's how they do this kind of run-tumble motion, right? Uh, let me see if I press this button, then the video will play again. So he beautifully visualized, absolutely stunning. Um, and I think this was a paper from, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, many years ago, right? So he was already able to, to measure uh, um, yeah, the motion of these cells. And then he measured the, st the speed and how quickly these bacteria swim, which is typically between 10 and 100 microns per second, which is fast, right? That's That's, you know over uh, over uh, 10 to 100 body lengths per second. And then he also measured the tumble, the tumble angles um, and, and from that, uh, how bacteria can move in chemical gradients as well. So this fluorescent microscopy is in principle in 2D, uh, but then uh, what perhaps uh, some of you do not know is that Howard Burke also developed a 3D tracking microscope. And here's a diagram of that scope, which is absolutely stunning. Um, so, so he didn't use a standard camera like we know them today in our lab, right? You, you're familiar with a microscope and just some cameras hooked up to it. But instead, he used these photomultiplier tubes. And then um, he would uh, you'd have all these very complicated feedback loops and analog circuits to, to track a single bacterium real time in space. And if the bacteria would swim in one direction, then, you know, the, uh, um, uh, the, the system would follow that bacterium with an incredibly high speed. And, and it has to be a very, very high speed because, you know, they swim 10 to 100 body lengths per second. And, and so, yeah, I really recommend reading this paper. Uh, it's the first one here in this reference list, uh, Berg, How to Track Bacteria, Review of Scientific Instruments from 1971. So, yeah, I guess that's over... What is it? Uh, Fifty years ago now, um, and just the the amount of electronics, optics, uh, insight into the biology uh, is just absolutely stunning. 
Uh, so, so for someone who's, you know, working across the disciplines, you know, this, this is it, right? <laughs> uh, and then, of course, um, yeah, he wrote many books that are super famous, Random Walks in Biology. I think that's a really nice one to read. Um, it's super accessible as well. So, so if you don't uh, know too much about bacteria or if you don't know too much about the pathways inside these cells, this is a great way to get familiar with that. Um, and then a later book as well, E. coli in Motion, uh, that was, uh, I think, uh, published um, uh, with a newer version in, in 2004, which is really beautiful. Um, so, so yeah, if, if you're interested in, in Howard's uh, uh, work, yeah, I, I truly recommend reading these, uh, these articles. Uh, and of course, this, this started the whole field, right? Uh, so then people started building on this. Um, and then around 2000 people started tracking bacteria using CCD cameras for the first time. Uh, so, so instead of using these photomultiplier tubes, then you could actually have a two dimensional array of sensors. Uh, and then if you use some clever optics, especially this little diaphragm over here, that allows you to project uh, the position of the cell in the X, Z plane, as well as a second CCD camera that, would, that you would use to look at uh, the sample from the side, and that would give the motion in the X, uh, 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 in the Y, Z plane. And so then together you could reconstruct the three-dimensional trajectory of these uh, bacteria uh, as they swim along. And, and again, this is very complicated because they swim extremely fast. They will literally just zip across the screen um, and so the frame rates that you would need for these cameras is, is just very much on the edge of what was possible at the time, right? So, so kudos seriously for, for you know, all the thoughts uh, and, 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 and all the, yeah, the disciplines that have to embrace each other um, uh, to, to make this possible. Um, then uh, another uh, way of tracking bacteria is using Lagrangian uh, 3D tracking. And so what you would do here is that you would have a microscope, for example, um, and then um, you follow this uh, bacteria just with a single camera and you move your stage to the left, to the right and up or down with, with uh, you know, for example, uh, an electronic feedback system. So you could use a, a piezo stage, for example. And then if your bacterium swims a little bit to the right, you would pick that motion up with your camera. Then you will send a signal to your computer and then uh, says, oh, wait, the bacteria is moving to the right. Now we have to move the stage. Uh, and then the bacteria comes back to the center of the stage again. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and then, yeah, if you have a very careful feedback system here, then, uh, then you can follow a cell in three dimensions that way. This is, of course, a little bit challenging also uh, because what happens if the cell goes out of focus, right? You have a very thin focal plane. And then again, you need a, a feedback system for that as well. So you could kind of scan your stage up and down and then look for the, uh, the highest intensity value, see when is this bacterium perfectly in focus, and if it moves upwards a little bit, then you will move your stage down. And if it moves down, you move your stage upwards. Um, and, and so that's, uh, that's how you could do this. But again, you need extremely fast feedback uh, loop systems for this. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's only since quite recently that this is actually doable, I think, from a scientific point of view. Besides this Lagrangian 3D tracking, there are also other methods that were developed recently. Uh, so here is uh, another example. It's really beautiful. You can use phase contrast microscopy. Um, and actually, uh, the idea is, is, is so clean. Basically, what you, what you do is you use a phase uh, contrast objective on your microscope. And then when your bacterium is in focus, you'll see, you know, a nice little focused point. Uh, can, can you guys see my, my arrow, by the way, my pointer? Yes. Okay, great. So, so when the cell is in focus, you see a nice point, but when the cell goes out of focus, you see rings. And basically from the size of these rings, you can, uh, yeah, you can calculate the, the Z position uh, of, of your cell. But there are two problems here. Uh, first of all, in principle, this is symmetric, right? So you don't know if your cell is going above the focal plane or below the focal plane. 
Uh, and a trick that you can use there is um, you, you can use the correction color um, that, uh, that is used on these phase contrast objectives to correct for spherical aberrations. Um, and, and you can basically on purpose uh, screw this up a little bit. Oh, pardon my language. <clears throat> and so that would uh, that would make this a little bit asymmetric. Uh, and so then you can tell whether it's up or down. Uh, the second problem is that you need to build up a library, right? Um, so, so in principle, you don't really know uh, what a specific ring pattern, uh, what that would correspond to in terms of your Z position. So, so you have to first measure maybe some kind of reference set first, and then you can compare with your library, compare with your reference set um, and, and see uh, where your bacterium is located. So to do that, um, you could, for example, put some particles in a gel, um, and then they are basically fixed in that gel. And then you can slice through your sample with a very high resolution, uh, thin focal plane. And then you know, uh, you know, with a fairly high accuracy where all of these particles are fixed inside the cell by just slicing up and down through the sample. Uh, and then you switch to this uh, phase contrast method. And based on that, uh, you can build up your library. And then, and then you will do the same thing with the bacteria that are not sitting in the gel that are actually swimming around. Um, and then you can yeah, get all the information from that. Um, and, and this is uh, actually not very expensive because most people already have a microscope, right? And most people already have some kind of phase contrast objective. Um, and even if you don't have such an objective, I think they're maybe $1,000, $2,000 for a long working distance one. Um, and so, um, yeah, this, this is actually a very relatively in, uh, inexpensive and, and very effective way of doing this. Um, it just takes a little bit of time to build up this library, and then it also takes some time to uh, to write a computer program that will compare these um, these these rings with um, the measurements that you do later. Uh, another variation of this is to do the same thing with fluorescence, uh, and I think this is sometimes called defocused fluorescence microscopy. Um, and so again, you would see some kind of fluorescent rings in your um, uh, uh, in your camera. And then again, based on the size of the rings, you can back calculate the position of your bacterium in three dimensions. Now on the right hand side of this slide is holography. Um, and this is very similar, um, but there are some subtle differences, I think. Uh, so so the, um, the, the, ma the main way in which it works is basically you have a laser beam. And this laser beam comes down um, through your sample and then interacts with some particle that is sitting there, a bacterium or some kind of spherical colloid. And then this beam, uh, you know, will start uh, interacting, right? Um, and, uh, and then you create these holograms, again, rings. And the idea is, again, very similar that from the shape of the rings, you will infer the three-dimensional position of your cells. And, and so uh, in the next slide, we're going to talk in a lot of detail how that actually works. Uh, and this method has been very successful. People have used this to measure the speed of bacteria in three dimensions, the, the tumble angles uh, for many different species. Uh, and actually, you can also do this with LEDs. Uh, so there's a very beautiful paper by the group of uh, Roberto Di Leonardo, uh, the Bianchi et al. paper in PRX from 2017. Uh, and they use three different colors um, and then you get uh, kind of three different holograms that are sitting on top of each other in different um, uh, wavelengths. Uh, and from that, they were uh, able to look at bacteria close to surfaces and how they, how they wobble on the surfaces, um, not just getting information about their three-dimensional position, but also about their three-dimensional orientation. Uh, and, and so I think this is a very, very powerful technique. Uh, so, so what do you need? to do holography. Uh, here's basically an overview of a setup. Uh, it starts all with this laser beam. Uh, so you could, you could have a laser diode that comes from an optical fiber, for example. And then you have a collimator that makes sure that the beam is nice uh, and, and straight. And then that collimated beam goes through your sample over here. 
And this, this could really just be a simple glass slide with a cover slip. Um, and, and it need not be a fancy microfluidic device. It, it could really just be a simple motility chamber. Then below is your standard microscope uh, objective. Uh, and then you have some optics that brings it you know, down to a camera and that's it. Uh, and, and here is a version of that in our lab on the right. You can just see uh, you know, our microscope. Then up here, uh, we have our laser uh, and that little uh, yellow fiber that you see here is, is, um, yeah, is the laser, uh, the optical fiber. The beam goes down straight into the uh, objective um, and then uh, the uh, the holograms go down into the camera, which is which is just down here on the left. You can yeah, you cannot really see the camera, but but yeah, it's it's there, down below the microscope. Now you can also see how messy my lab is. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> so should have cleaned it up before <laughs> before I showed all you guys. <laughs> so it's relatively simple, right? You don't need too many things for this. Uh, so, so I actually made a shopping list for you guys as well. If you actually consider doing this, um, uh, what do you need? You need you need a laser and a driver, uh, and and I think you could go to uh, uh, to Thor Labs or you can go to uh, to uh, you know, any kind of vendor. Maybe I shouldn't uh, you know <laughs> advertise for anyone. Um, and uh, it doesn't need to be a very fancy laser. It usually costs, you know, about three thousand, four thousand um, dollars. The collimator lens uh, is about five hundred, uh, and and that's basically it. All the rest is optics that may already be inside your uh, microscope. So so an objective lens. Uh, you need a camera. You need a computer to uh, to decipher these holograms. We're going to talk about that. And then maybe you need to buy some test particles. So, for example, some polystyrene microspheres uh, just to, uh, uh, to, to calibrate your system. So if you add all of this up, then, yeah, I think you can, you can basically get a whole complete system for around 17K. Uh, or if you already have a microscope, I think, you know, you could do it around 5K even. Um, and so uh, this is not an expensive system. Um, it just takes a bit of time to set it all up. Uh, so let's talk about that. How do we set it all up? Here is the main idea. So we've got this laser beam that comes from the top, shines down through your sample, interacts with your particle, and then um, it, it uh, changes uh, the, um, the electric field that, uh, that you have here, right? So the intensity of, uh, of the light that you see is basically this electric field squared. This E naught is the is the unperturbed, uh, you know, incident plane wave, and then we have this scattered field, that is here the second term, and this 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 scattered field depends on the position of the particle, depends on the radius of the particle, and also depends on the refractive index of the particle. Well, and to be more specific, the refractive index of the particle compared to that of the medium. So, so um, you, you need a little bit of contrast to, to scatter these waves, right? Uh, and then you can describe this scattering using, uh, using uh, you know, the, the theory that was developed by Lorentz and me. Uh, and, and that works as follows. Uh, you basically have this scattered field, which you can describe in terms of, um, uh, you know, a series of uh, spherical harmonics. And, and uh, yeah, there's a really nice review paper that I would recommend reading about this, uh, Lee et al., uh, the uh, Optics Express paper down here on the bottom left corner, uh, published in uh, 2007. And they work out all of this theory. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, really what it depends on is uh, the refractive index of the particle, the position of the particle, and that will give you, in the end, the intensity of that electric field. And from that, you can also find uh, the intensity of the light. Uh, and then I have a second slide on that. Uh, there are all these coefficients that are called the lorentz mie scattering coefficients, uh, and they are known for a sphere. So, so these have been calculated analytically, and so these are very complicated formulas. Uh, but but uh, really what I would like you to get away uh, from this slide is that there are two important things. There's the relative radius of the particle compared to the wavelength of the light. And then there is the relative refractive index of the particle compared to that of the medium. 
So, so this relative radius is maybe worth thinking about a little bit. Um, what that means is that um, if your particle is, let's say, on the order of, you know, two to three microns, a typical bacterium, that's just a little bit larger than the wavelength of, let's say, blue light, uh, 500 nanometers, right? A factor of, what is it, uh, five to ten. Um, so that's uh, that's perfect. That's just about the, the regime that you want to sit in. Uh, so So this technique is really good for particles that are, let's say, between one micron up to five, 10 microns is really ideal. Uh, if you have really large um, cells that you want to track, imagine you want to track chlamydomonas or some, some microalgae, um, then um, you could use a different wavelength of light or, um, or, or you could, for example, use this phase contrast method that I talked about earlier. Um, and, um, yeah, that, that would probably be better. Uh, but for bacteria, this is absolutely wonderful because you're sitting just about in the right um, yeah, uh, particle size regime. So between one and 10 microns approximately. In terms of the refractive index, um, then uh, uh, you, you can do anything that is larger than the refractive index of the, of the medium. So, so if you have water, um, then uh, yeah, you, you can do... Um, Anything up to silica beads, for example, that have a fairly large refractive index, 1.5, 1 1.6. 1 uh, bacteria, on the other hand, they are almost little bags of proteins, right? So there's a lot of water inside. And so their refractive index is, is not much larger than that of the medium. And that's what makes this a little bit more tricky than doing holography with, let's say, standard plastic particles or glass particles, just because the refractive index of the bacteria is, is really low, um, but but it can still be done. Uh, so, so you need a good camera, basically. Uh, and uh, then, um, once you have these holograms, then you want to you, you want to decipher them, right? You want to back calculate the three dimensional position of your particle. And one way to do that is to use this Lorentz me theory. Uh, so, so you can just calculate from this theory that you know that that we just talked about um, what um, what these uh, uh, holograms should look like. Uh, so you could compare your experiment with some kind of fit. Um, and then just optimize for the for the best possible fit on the theorem. You do some kind of uh, regression, it's a somewhat nonlinear regression, uh, but but it can be done, and uh, and that will give you the three dimensional position. Uh, you can also speed this up a little bit by using uh, machine learning, uh, and so this is where Lauren Altman comes in, um, who is a postdoc here at Penn. Uh, she's a fellow of the. Uh, Center for Soft and Living Matter with us, um, and she worked with Doug Jurian. Uh, and Lauren um, did her PhD with uh, David Greer at uh, New York University, and, and she really built this wonderful system to, uh, to look at holograms uh, using these physics-informed neural networks. And so, on the one hand, these are neural networks that, uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, uh, that, that use a library just from from training this network right but uh, but it also uses information from the lorentz me theory to optimize this training so it's physics informed and uh, and and they're really very good and they're good for three things first of all you can identify the holograms in your uh, in your camera image uh, so those are the the little boxes that you see here right the red box orange green and, and the cyan one then once you've identified the holograms, then you want to compare them with this Lorentz me theory or with your library. Uh, and that will give you as output, you know, the, the three dimensional position, the refractive index of your particle, the size of your particle. Um, and, um, and, uh, and then you can make plots like this. Uh, and if you now have, for example, a, um, a sample that has different types of bacteria or different types of particles, then you can again use this machine learning to classify them, right? So you can identify regions in your uh, parameter space of the things that you've observed. So different particle sizes here on the uh, horizontal axis and different, different refractive indices on the, on the vertical axis. 
So you can classify these and maybe identify different species of bacteria in your sample as well. Uh, and, and I think this could also be very interesting for pathogen detection that you could, uh, for example, differentiate E. coli from Salmonella, for example. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, these neural networks are interesting for three things. First, detecting the features, then actually, you know, deciphering the holograms, and step three, doing some kind of categorization on this information as well. Lauren did a lot more work uh, in, in, uh, in Davis lab. Uh, so she also looked at uh, not just spherical particles, but particles that have some kind of elongation. Uh, so the first thing she did was to look at dimers. Uh, so these are just two uh, spherical colloids that are linked together. Um, and when you look at the holograms of these dimers, you see that they are not symmetric anymore. And so what that means is that you, you see these kind of, um, yeah, uh, uh, tilted patterns appear. They're, they're not exactly perfect rings anymore. Uh, they, move, they look a little bit more like ellipses with, uh, with changes in the variation. Um, and so if you then um, again do this Lorentz me theory, but now for two particles instead of one, uh, then again you can calculate all of the electric fields, you can find the resulting light intensity, you can do the fit of your particles, and what you end up with is something like this. You have this, um, uh, again, the particle size that is sitting here on the horizontal axis and the refractive index on the vertical axis, and, and you find a line in this parameter space. Uh, and, and so we know that these are just uh, uh, dimers, right? So, so the particle size is not actually varying, but the thing that is varying is the orientation of the particles. So what that means is that if your particle is horizontal, then it appears to have a lower refractive index. So basically the laser light uh, goes, uh, goes through more easily. And if the particle, uh, if, if, the, if the dimer is or oriented vertically, then the laser has to go through, these, through this dimer vertically. And so the refractive index appears to be a little bit larger. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, you can map out a lot of different uh, particle orientations. Uh, and from this, you can again compute a map where the ones all the way on the bottom right corner correspond to the dimers that are oriented perfectly horizontal compared to your glass light. And the ones in the top left corner are oriented vertically. So, so this uh, allows you not just to look at the orientation in plane, but also the orientation out of the plane of the microscope. So, so you really get the, 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 the three-dimensional orientation from this. Uh, so after doing this with dimers, then, then she also repeated this um, with uh, um, uh, elongated particles. Uh, let me see, where is that? Uh, Oh yeah, here, here was just a comparison between the simulation and the experiments. Uh, and, and then she also did it with these nice elongated particles. Uh, so, so these are kind of tactoidal particles. And here you can see a picture on the left of an electron micrograph. Um, so they, lit, they look a little bit like E. coli, right? Uh, so they're, you know, about uh, two to three microns in length and uh, maybe one micron or so in diameter. Uh, and here the same thing happens, um, that uh, you can make a direct map for the orientation of these particles in the, uh, in the angle that's out of plane, uh, yeah, based on these holograms. Um, and so now that really means that we're in business, right? Because if we can do this for particles that are shaped like a bacterium, um, then why not try it with actual bacteria? Uh, so, so when Lauren then uh, moved to Penn, uh, just about a year or two ago, uh, uh, yeah, she knocked on our door and said, hey guys, <laughs> I have this really amazing, you know, uh, uh, you know, method, uh, and uh, maybe we could apply this to bacteria. So, um, uh, so you know, we, we took some E. coli, we put them under the microscope, um, and, then, uh, and then Lauren built this uh, holographic setup. And, and here, uh, this is the result. This is what you see. 
So, so on the left uh, hand side, you see a video of the holograms uh, that are evolving real time. Um, and, and you can see a lot of asymmetry in this hologram, right? So, and that corresponds to those different orientations of the cell. And then you also see that the size of the rings is kind of growing and shrinking. And that corresponds to the three-dimensional position of the cell. Um, so if you now back calculate all of this, uh, then you can find a trajectory. Uh, and here you go. Here you can see that trajectory. Here is our cell. And it's, it's swimming around in a circle. Do you see that? So it's sitting close to the, uh, to the bottom glass uh, surface. Uh, and we know that bacteria like to swim around in, surface, uh, in circles, close to surfaces. And so this is, uh, uh, yeah, a very beautiful way of imaging that. Uh, and and besides um, uh, looking at their position in three dimension, uh, we also see uh, the orientation, right? So we can actually reconstruct um, the orientation of the cells as they move along, um, including this kind of wobbling angle. So so when a cell comes close to a surface, it's it tends to kind of wobble up and down. And so yeah, you can get this as well. Um, and so then uh, we started uh, working with a graduate student of mine, Ran Tao, and he's interested in generating hypermotile mutants. Um, and the way uh, that this is done is um, you basically have some soft agar plates and you put some bacteria right in the middle and then they start you know, spreading out on these plates over time. And then you can select the cells from the edge of the plate, the ones that were swimming the fastest. And then you re-inoculate them in the middle of a new plate. And you repeat this again and again. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and Ron, he did this uh, for, uh, for 30 days. So, so 30 different cycles. Um, and, uh, and, and you can see his picture over here. Um, you know, Ron is actually a marathon runner. Uh, and he's not just a marathon runner outside the lab, but he's also a marathon runner inside the lab. <laughs> it's actually incredible how you know how much uh, uh, yeah effort uh, yeah he, he put into this, um, and uh, and and also he works with a group of really wonderful undergraduate students, um, uh, Suya and Jada. So I should really also uh, yeah uh, uh, mention their names as well. Uh, um, so he's been doing these uh, selection experiments and, and basically this, this takes days, right? And the uh, time scale of cell division is on the order of you know, 20 minutes. So you get lots and lots of generations here. Uh, and if you start doing this um, again and again, you, you keep on selecting the cells that went fastest, then you start selecting for specific mutants, the mutants that were going faster. Uh, and... Uh, and so that's the main idea here, that, that you get uh, different phenotypes from these types of experiments, <laughs> which, which Ron likes to call the lazy ones and the motile ones. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if the lazy ones are actually lazy. I think they, they, you know, they just optimized for different things. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's another story. Um, so, so then we thought, okay, well, let's look at these different cells with holography. So, so strain A are the lazy ones, or you know, the not so motile ones, and strain F are the are the the hyper motile ones. And and yeah, you can really uh, see a really clear difference. Um, the uh, yeah, the 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 orange strain here is much much faster. We we get some cells that are going around a hundred microns per second, and these are E. coli. So, so, you know, that's, that's what you wouldn't really expect that from E. coli. Um, and, uh, and also we see that these, um, these hypermotile strains, they tend to hug the surfaces more closely. They spend much more time close to the channel walls. Um, and, uh, uh, and on the other hand, if you look at their morphology, if so if you look at these, these, uh, these holograms, then the, 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 the cell size isn't, very different. Uh, the cell shape isn't very different. Um, so, so uh, yeah, it's, it's probably to do with the number of flagella that these uh, that these strains have. Um, and so, for that, we need a different type of imaging. So, the next thing we'll have to do is some electron microscopy to, to actually see, uh, yeah, what uh, what the flagella uh, thing look like. Uh, but this is really interesting for us because. 
now we can start looking at uh, yeah, different phenotypes using holography. Um, before I end this part of the talk, I also wanted to talk a little bit about advantages and disadvantages. So if you use, uh, you know, 3D uh, uh, tracking, then, you know, you get correct measurements of the speed. You can also get nice, correct measurements of the tumbling angles. And, and for 2D measurements, you know, that is just not quite so good. You can still make an estimate of the speed, but you get fairly large errors. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, this, uh, uh, this, this beautiful paper by Katja, Katja Taute, Nature Communication 2015, um, I really recommend reading that. Uh, she, she has a really nice discussion on this too. And then maybe just one more comparison of holography compared to these other Lagrangian 3D tracking techniques. Um, on the one hand, with holography, you're limited to a fixed field of view, right? So your camera is just fixed in place, your laser is fixed in place, nothing's moving, and your cells will leave the field of view. But uh, the advantage is that you could track many cells at the same time. Uh, so you get a lot of data for whatever happens within your field of view. And Lagrangian tracking, on the other hand, you can move the field of view, you can move the microscope state, so you can really sample the entire uh, sample, uh, but you can only track one cell at a time. Uh, so these are the kind of you know, uh, yeah, pros and cons. And then maybe one more exciting thing to mention is that with holography, uh, you can do a lot more. Uh, so you can also build holographic optical tweezers. Um, so, you, so you cannot just look at the cells, but you can actually manipulate them as well. You can actually hold them in place. Uh, and, and so the, the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, you know, was, uh, was given for this in 2018. Um, so I think this is a nice way to end the first part of the talk. And if there are any questions, I think, I think that would be a good moment. What do you guys think? <laughs>